Hello and welcome back to the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. My name is Jeremy Howard. I'm the staff pastor here at Orchard Hills Bible Church in Payson, Utah. Thanks for joining me today. What I'm doing in this series is just going along with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Sunday School schedule through the Old Testament. Uh, I have for, the, for those who have been around for a while, you know, I'm using this schedule I found on Pinterest. Uh, <laughs> with that really sweet clip art of the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Ark and the Ten Commandments. Anyway, today we find ourselves in 2 Kings 2 through 7. That's the passage for this week. And uh, we're actually going to be looking at just chapter 5, the first 14 verses of 2 Kings 5. And uh, in this passage, we're going to see uh, a great miracle of God through the prophet Elisha. So Elijah with a J and Elisha with an S-H, they were prophets in Israel who performed many miracles. So not only are we just jumping into this one miracle of uh, Elisha's ministry, the second one with an S-H, Elisha, but we're also jumping into a time in Israel's history where there were a lot of miracles. This was a, a great pouring out of signs and wonders during Israel's existence. And uh, what's really fascinating about this miracle is that it's not performed on an Israelite, but on uh, this other guy that you're going to find out about, a guy named Naaman. All right, so let's just jump into it. Second Kings chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Notice God doesn't just give victory to his own people, Israel, but he's giving victory to this uh, other nation group of people, Aram. All right, and he, Naaman was the captain of the army of Aram, and through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Pretty interesting. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now, leprosy is a skin disease. Uh, in the Old Testament, it means all kinds of skin diseases. But basically, uh, it, leprosy is chronic. Okay, Someone who isn't healed of this by God's hand is going to deal with this all of his life, and it will eventually, likely, kill that person. So Naaman was a great warrior. However, he had this disease. So you can see the tension there, especially for his people who really respect him and like him as a warrior. They feel like they need him, but he's got leprosy. So he's not outside the camp like a lot of lepers were. He's right there with everybody uh, because he's a valiant warrior. And boy, it sure would be great if he would be healed, they thought. Well, it says in verse 2, now the Aramaeans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. All right, so uh, in a battle against Israel, Naaman and the Aramaeans, his people, had succeeded uh, to some degree here. Succeeded so much that Naaman was able to take captive a little girl from the Israelites, and he gave this little girl to his wife that she would wait on her and care for her. Well, apparently they treated this little girl well, Naaman and his wife, because the little girl says that she wishes that Naaman would be healed. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Uh, and she doesn't just say, you know, wishful thinking, like, ah, oh, it sure would be great if he was healed, like everybody else in Aram. But she says specifically, that if he was with that prophet who's dwelling in Samaria, then he would be healed. So apparently before she was taken off in captivity, this little girl had some exposure to Elisha, the prophet, through whom God was working all of these miracles. And so she's saying, hey, if, if he could be connected with him, 
uh, that would change Naaman's life. That would turn his life around. And from her perspective, she thought that would be a great thing. Well, uh, Naaman, of course, has this interaction with the king that you just heard, the king of Aram, who says, okay, well, let's do it. And he piles up a bunch of gifts, a lot of monetary gifts here, and says, let's go. Uh, go to the king of Israel, and let's see if, if we can get you healed. That would be great. Everyone has incentive here to get Naaman healed, and that is, uh, that's the goal. So let's now pick up in the story in verse 6. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is making or seeking a quarrel against me. So the king of Israel, who was Joram at the time, not a good guy. Israel had a lot of bad kings, and this is one of them. He doesn't even think of Elisha, apparently. He gets this letter from the king of Aram, and the king of Aram says, Hey, uh, it'd be great if you could heal, <laughs> if you could heal Naaman. And Joram doesn't think, Oh, yeah, I should send him to Elisha, because Elisha is the one who's doing all these miracles. Joram actually did not like Elisha at all. And so he says, I can't do anything like that. I can't do anything with you. Why would you why would you come to me? I don't have any power to do that. Not exactly a man of great faith, not exactly a man who pays attention to what God is saying to him. Because if he had been paying attention, if he had been walking by faith, he would, of course, pay attention to the Lord's prophet and know what God is doing in Israel through the prophet Elisha. But alas, he was not. Verse 8. It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Hey, we'll stop right there. Word got back to Elisha that the king hadn't thought of him as the source of healing, God's source of healing in the land. And so he sends a letter to the king, who doesn't like him, and says, Hey, send him to me. Remember me? Send him to me. And he adds in that letter a purpose, so that he may know. Did you catch this? Let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. That's the end of verse 8. The purpose of this miracle, this cleansing that's going to be worked in Naaman's life, is that he would pay attention to God's prophet. Not that he would be healed for healing's sake, but that he would pay attention to God's words coming through his prophet. All right? Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. I find this kind of interesting. Naaman comes with his posse to Elisha's house. He's at Elisha's door, and Elisha doesn't even come to the door. He sends a messenger. I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, this is a valiant warrior from another land who has had success against Israel and has taken a little girl from Israel to be his wife's servant. And Elisha's just like, yeah, who are you? You're no one to me. <laughs> he's not bowing down. He's not giving gifts. He's not offering him anything. But he says, hey, here's what you do. Go down to the Jordan River and get in there seven times, and you'll be cleansed. And, and isn't this amazing? I mean, Elisha's the one who just said, send him to me, and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel. So maybe in your mind, as you read that, it's like there's going to be this really dramatic thing that happens, this really dramatic moment where Elisha is going to come and speak very reverently and powerfully, and there's going to be a lot of fanfare, and there will be just this amazing event. But instead, you've got Naaman on the front porch, and... Uh, Elisha saying to one of his assistants, hey, just go let him know he needs to jump in the river seven times as he's you know, scribbling away, writing something, or doing whatever he's doing. <laughs> it's just not what most of us would have anticipated. But God's, God's working here. All right? Verse 10. Uh, sorry, verse 11. 
But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, far better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. Now, during a... Uh, a time of great miracles in Israel, it's understandable that one would anticipate just an amazing display of miraculous power. Naaman was anticipating that, and that's obviously not what he got, and so he threw a fit. And he's looking at the objects through which God is going to bring healing, and he's saying, this doesn't make any sense to me. I've got access to greater rivers than the Jordan River, what does he mean? Go get in the Jordan and be clean seven times, or jump in seven times and be clean. Well, there was nothing special about the Jordan River other than this is the river that God has chosen for this miracle. It's the river that God has placed in, in Israel. So Naaman is focusing on the, the objects, the things he can see. He's not walking by faith here, is he? Because faith is... Uh, something that we walk by as opposed to sight. Faith is the, uh, the substance of, of things not seen. It's, it's what's hoped for. Uh, that's what faith is. And Naaman isn't walking by faith, but he's looking at these objects and saying, yeah, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm, I'm sinking pomp and circumstance here, and you're not delivering. Well, um, we, we can make a note here and say, Let's not be Naaman's. Let's not look on the outside. Let's not look at the big show of beauty and power, the flexing of muscles of man as evidence for God's working. But let's look at what God has called us to look at. Let us look to God himself in faith. Because I tell you what, you'll have some of the most powerful experiences with God in the most crummy places on earth, <laughs> in the most crummy situations on earth. You may have been told that, you know, to meet God, it needs to be a very ornate and uh, extremely uh, reverent as far as, you know, man kind of setting the context, making it very reverent situation. It, there needs to be you know, a room with, with really nice furniture. You need to kind of set the stage here with something just really, really nice, and then God shows up. Uh, the, you can look at the Roman Catholic Church throughout history or other religions like them. And look at the big ornate buildings that they've made. You know, there's this idea that if you if you make something really nice for God and then go in it, then he'll show up. Well, here we're seeing that the measly little Jordan River, according to Naaman, that's the place where God's going to show up. <laughs> Not these great rivers, great waters that Naaman knows about. So walking by faith doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to... Uh, you know, have this, this perfect kind of situation and from man's perspective where you'll meet God. But it's you're just following God wherever he sends you, whether that's a measly river to jump in and out seven times, or if it's a really nice building. Nothing against nice buildings. And sometimes that's what God wants. But here we see that's, that's not it. Quit looking on the outside here, Naaman. And listen to the prophet of the Lord. Listen to the words of the Lord through the prophet and follow him into that little river, the Jordan. And so he does. Verse 13, as Naaman's throwing a fit here about Elisha's message to him. It says, Naaman's servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So they're saying, look, if you would have said, you know, go climb that mountain and you'll be healed at the top of that mountain, that would have made sense to you. Like, oh, that's a big thing to do. And, and you would have done it. Well, look, he's given you a, a little thing to do. How much more did you just do that? 
Okay, well, that makes sense to Naaman, verse 14. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Wow, that's, that's a really, really cool story. And uh, the New Testament makes a reference to this in Luke chapter 4. Let me show that to you. Luke 4, 27. It says, There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Well, the Israelites uh, did not walk by faith during this time. There's not much good to be said about the Israelites. Not many of those lepers, it seems, were seeking to be healed in faith, and they weren't. Not one of them was healed uh, during that time. The only leper that was healed through the ministry of Elisha was Naaman, this uh, Aramean. That's, uh, that's pretty interesting to me. Well, what can we take away? What can we take away from this? Well, um, we can take away this really, really basic thing. Do not seek miracles, but seek the God of miracles. There are so many people in this world who are just wanting a sign from God. They're wanting to experience something with God. They have these ideas in their head of what they want, just like Naaman did. Naaman clearly had this thought in his head of, of what healing should look like, what the experience should be like. And that's not it. Uh, that, that wasn't it for him. Instead, he needed just to humbly submit to the word of God being spoken of through this prophet. And so, too, in our lives, we can have so many things in our head that, that we're supposed to experience, that we're supposed to do, that, that we should have. But instead, what we need to do is humbly seek the Lord through his word. God has spoken so much to us in the Bible. God has given us 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. What are we doing seeking any other experience if we haven't read what he's already given us? <laughs> you know, to put it in another way, to fit the story with Naaman, what his servant said to him, you know, if God were to call you to go climb, and in my case, it might be Mount Nebo, which is right outside our window here. If God said, go climb Mount Nebo, and he's going to meet you up there, you'd be ready to do it. It's like, yeah, let's go. I got to climb that thing because he, he told me that's where he's going to meet me. That's what I'm supposed to do. Well, how much more then should you read these 66 books of the Bible that God has given you? God's given you a book. And what are you doing skipping over the basic principles to seek some other kind of experience? You know, some people want to have the, just a, like to live in the supernatural and just all the time be experiencing you know, I hear something from God and, and God, uh, you know, spoke this to me through this person or God, you know, had me healed from this thing amazingly. I mean, just all sorts of, uh, you know, miracles that people want to experience. And yet, a lot of times, these are the people who aren't faithfully showing up and serving in their local churches. What are you doing jumping ahead to something amazingly miraculous when you're ignoring the first principles, the, the basic foundation of Christian living. God has saved you if you're a believer in the gospel, the biblical gospel. God has saved you and placed you in a family of believers. And you're seeking your own individual life experiences of, again, pomp and circumstance, and totally ignoring the fact that God has called you to be a part of a, a local church to love and, and serve those fellow believers in Jesus Christ who submit to the God of the Bible, who seek his face together. Things are just out of order here. And so in Naaman's life, he was, he was getting some things out of order. <laughs> he wasn't listening to the word of the prophet, and he was really mad that he wasn't experiencing miracles. I'm like, well, wait a second. Let's listen to what God has said before we ever start expecting miracles in our lives. Let's hear the word of the Lord, study the word of the Lord, and do the word of the Lord before we start, you know, trying to go out and, and experience these unique miracles in life. There's some basics here that, that we need to make sure we, we catch. Because if you miss the basics, you're never going to get 
the more detailed, intricate, and complicated things of life. All right. Well, um, I don't know. There's just a random smattering of thoughts based on <laughs> based on Second Kings chapter five. It's a very interesting story. There are a whole bunch of interesting stories with stew and axe heads and bears and all kinds of stuff in Second Kings. I suggest you read it, check it out, see what God has for you there. And until next time, uh, thanks for joining me. And if you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out to us. You can go to our website, ohbcpayson.com. You can also go to orchardhillsbiblechurch.com. Check us out there, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. God bless.